What's going on, guys? This is Rob, and um, let's talk about this Eternals movie. <laughs> um, would I have given this movie a 59% on Rotten Tomatoes? No. Do I understand why some people did? Yes. Okay, so so as always when it comes to these things, right, uh, one thing that I want to make clear, the dislikes that I had for this movie weren't really tied to the comics. And there's a reason for that, right? So um, one of the things we talked about here, right? Like the Eternals first appeared in the 70s. Ever since the Eternals showed up in Marvel Comics, the biggest struggle Marvel has had is getting people to care about the Eternals. Because by and large, they just seem unnecessary, right? The role of the Eternals in Marvel Comics is to safeguard humanity from the deviants and whatever threats may befall the Earth from beyond the stars, right? You know, extraterrestrials, different things like that. But as time has progressed, and as humanity has grown more powerful in the comics, now you got stuff like the X-Men and X-Factor and X-Force and Alpha Flight and Omega Flight and Big Hero 6 and the Avengers and the New Avengers and the Mighty Avengers and West Coast Avengers and you know, all kinds of stuff, right? You got all kinds of, of teams that exist out there. And that's to say nothing of ultra powerful beings like Hyperion and the Sentry or Franklin Richards or the Molecule Man, Owen Reese. And just those four guys, their powers dwarf the powers of the Eternals themselves. So by and large, there isn't a need for the Eternals to safeguard humanity from anything because humanity can protect itself. And so ever since then, no one's really cared about the Eternals because no one's wrote a compelling story to give people a reason to care about the Eternals. So I didn't really go into this film expecting this to basically pick up and to correct all the mistakes that the comics had made. Having said that, the movie had pluses and it had minuses, just like any movie. So let's start with the things that I loved about this. So overall, just in terms of how the movie looked, not really focusing on the character development or anything like that, but just the visual look of the film, it was gorgeous, right? The soundtrack was fantastic. The special effects were mind blowing, right? Absolutely loved it. It just, it was a visually stunning film. One of the things that I loved the most about this, and I was a little uncertain about how it would unfold, the Celestials, right? The Celestials, were enormous. They were every bit as imposing as you would expect them to be, right? Okay, so let's say I'm Erishim the Judge, right? Just to give you guys perspective. Let's say I'm Erishim the Judge and I'm holding my hand out, right? The Eternals were like that tall in my hand. They were minuscule in comparison to the size of the Celestials, which really gets me excited about what like Galactus would look like in the MCU, right? Like imagine just a person who looks like they're in a giant purple suit who's just that big, right? It's just, it was, it was, it was crazy how imposing they were. One of the other things I loved about this film was the deviants. They looked great. Oh my God, they looked phenomenal, which makes sense. One of the things I didn't expect going into this movie is for the deviants to look like they do in the comics, right? Where they look like trolls or monsters or something like that. Honestly, I don't even think that would have been cool if it happened because I felt like it would have made the movie feel laughable, right? It would have it would have felt goofy. You see these kind of trollish looking monsters that are just, it would have just felt too nonsensical even for a comic book film. We know that's one of the things the MCU does. They take things that we would historically see as being sort of like monsterish looking and they kind of make them a little more sleek, a little more modern and it, and it works, right? It looks really, really awesome. So I loved the way the Deviants looked in this film. A couple of the other things that I love kind of rounding out this, this bit of list, I did love the emergence event. That was great. And it was everything I was hoping it would be, right? Everything that I was hoping it would be. The motivation behind why the emergence is happening, who it is that's emerging, I was I was super excited for that, right? I thought it was really, really awesome. The funny thing about this emergence thing though, is that if you're looking and if you're really, really paying attention, there's some big impacts it has on potentially a landmass that exists between America and another country ruled by a guy. Just saying, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No spoilers, like no, no spoilers for that part. I'll let you guys know when there are spoilers. Honestly, uh, the emergence was great, right? It was really, really cool. And it was, it was just, it was, the, the 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 intensity of that right like the significance of that what happens if the emergence actually takes place it was phenomenal so i absolutely love that and the final thing that i loved about this movie was actually a character dane whitman i loved dane whitman and i didn't think i would i've never cared about dane whitman there's never been an instance in the history of my life when i've been reading marvel comics like oh my god cool a new black knight series is coming out i can't wait to get to the store and read that that's never happened <laughs> Ever, over the course of my life, I have never, ever, ever been excited about the Black Knight. 
I'm excited as hell to see what they do with this character in the MCU. I am super hyped about that. I think part of it's because it's just Kit Harrington, and I don't know what it is, man, but that guy just, he's just got it, man. Like, it's just, I, I don't I don't know. I love him as an actor. I think he's phenomenal. I think the, the, the kind of character development and just the way he existed in the MCU, the kind of questions he asked, in a lot of ways, he was a stand-in for us. Uh, I think it was great. I think it was really, really cool. And I'm excited to see where he goes. Now, having said that, Let's focus on the stuff that I didn't like about this movie. And this portion will probably include some spoilers. So first things first, the film was like 75% dialogue. You can't go into this movie expecting it to be like your standard Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, where there's like a lot of action, a lot of fight scenes that happen over the course of the film. You did have some fight scenes, but none of them felt like they mattered. None of them felt like they were relevant. We'll talk about that here in a second. The movie was mostly dialogue and flashbacks. Now this is the most disappointing thing about the flashbacks that they had. The flashbacks did deal with the Eternals themselves, but because 75% of the movie was basically dialogue and it was the Eternals going and finding other Eternals. The flashbacks you get are basically held strictly to those Eternals. Now that in and of itself is not a bad thing. The problem is there's nothing that tells you that is in the MCU. Outside of a reference to the blip, that's it. That's, that's the only thing you get. And I felt like these were some huge missed opportunities. And here's the reason why. So this is one of those spoiler parts that what you ended up getting was this point whereby the Eternals basically broke apart, right? They split apart and they just went out into the world and just lived their lives. And so the question that most all of us were left asking and the question that we wanted to have answered in this movie is what were the Eternals doing during some of the seminal moments or seminal points in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the invasion of New York, when Thanos blinked out half the life in the universe. Now, I do agree that the movie didn't need to focus on Thanos. If they had brought Thanos in, they had given us the backstory of Thanos, it would have turned into a Thanos-centric film, right? We can all admit that because Thanos is so popular in the MCU. So I understand their desire to avoid that. Having said that, it didn't mean that you had to show Thanos, that with the Eternals going out into the world and living for thousands of years, they formed a lot of interpersonal relationships relationships. They had lovers and they had co-workers and they had friends and possibly even had some measure of family, right? Like they married into a family because Eternals can't necessarily procreate. They can't do it in the comics and they can't do it here. So it makes sense they wouldn't really be able to have kids of their own, but they made a life for themselves. They developed interpersonal relationships. And I felt like it would have really added to the gravity of both the character development and their role in the MCU if they had to watch people they care about get dusted and then deal with the aftermath of that even if you never see Thanos, right? A really good example of this is WandaVision, right? Like Monica Rambeau popped back up and as she's running through the hospital, people are just reappearing, right? You never see Thanos, but you understand what's going on, that people are coming back after the Incredible Hulk snapped his fingers and brought everybody back. And then that's basically it, right? So you get that kind of moment. Give us the other half of that, right? People disappearing, that these Eternals out there are losing friends that they've had for like 20 years of their life. Just different things along those lines, right? Give us those little tidbits there. We didn't really get that. One of the things that I thought would have been really cool is that because the Eternals were essentially just masquerading as humans, they obviously wouldn't necessarily use their powers and they didn't really use their powers unless they absolutely had to. And if they did, they largely used them in secret, meaning nobody in the superhero community was aware of the fact that they existed. So it would have been really, really cool to see a scene if like in the first Avengers movie, one of the Eternals was in New York and there was some giant chunk of a building that was falling down. We know the Eternal would survive it. The Eternal knows they would survive it, although they don't really see it landing down on them. And in the midst of all that, Iron Man just flies in, saves him, and then just flies away, having no idea of what it is that he's doing. He's just saving a regular person as far as he's concerned. But in reality, he's saving an Eternal that didn't need to be saved. Just one of those instances where the Eternals and superheroes in the MCU cross paths, not really knowing it. But the Eternals, given their longevity, know who Iron Man is, right? You could also do things like Faustus, who was the kind of like scientific technological guy of the Eternals worked for S.H.I.E.L.D. or he was one of the guys who worked in Stark Industries or something like that. Not because he had to, but because he wanted to and he loves technology, things along those lines. Somebody like Druig was responsible for basically leading the government or having a hand in the government that was just terrorizing and destroying people's lives in Sokovia. And that's what led to people like Wanda and Pietro overthrowing the Sokovian government. Just things along those lines, right? Just those small little moments, little tidbits that would have made the movie feel like it was in the MCU. Because the reality is, 
It doesn't. The movie does not feel like it's in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The only reason you know it's in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is because it's a Marvel film. But if Marvel took their name off of it and released this movie, you would never know. You would have no idea that it's part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I think that's an issue. Now, this was compounded by kind of a point that we made earlier, that there weren't a whole lot of action scenes. And the action scenes they did have didn't really seem to serve a purpose. That's one of the bigger issues, right? The deviants are in there, but the deviants feel more of a background thing. So you do see scenarios where the Eternals fight the deviants, but it feels like it's just something they're doing while the ma while the bigger plot's going on. It doesn't feel any different than like Iron Man going into a store and buying a Coke. It's kind of what it feels like, you know what I mean? Where it's just like a thing they happen to be doing at the time. There's no real significance there, right? It doesn't feel like it's a major point in the movie or that it has any real bearing on the movie. And in fact, the deviants themselves kind of felt like they were just crammed into the movie for the purpose of giving us kind of an interim villain until we actually get to the main plot, the main goal of the film. And I feel like that just sort of takes away from it all. This is particularly important because once you get to the final fight between Crow and the, the Eternals themselves, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't, it's like the outcome of the fight just feels completely and totally irrelevant. Like, okay, cool, whatever, you know, and then that's it, right? So it's just kind of like, I mean, I, I mean, what was the point of having the deviants in the movie like that? I guess the deviants are there to justify the existence of the Eternals, but at that point, if the deviants existing is to simply just justify the existence of the Eternals and why they're there, then just remove the deviants and the justification and give the Eternals a different justification for being there and then just call it a day. The other part of this, and, and this is kind of the last, um, I guess complaint that I have here is that the Eternals themselves felt boring. They felt like they don't matter. Um, I feel like in six months, if I was on a comic book reader, in six months, I will have forgotten the names of the Eternals or I'd be mispronouncing them. So instead of calling her Athena, I'd be calling her Athena or something like that, right? They they are largely forgettable, right? They just don't really feel like they matter. There was no point where I came out of this movie and I was like, oh my God, dude, those characters are so cool. I really hope Disney Plus gives us a series on like Cersei or Athena or Icarus or, or like Sprite or Fostos or Druig or any of those guys. I, I really hope we get that. There was no part about this that was like, man, these are great. I can't wait to see what the future holds for the Eternals. Didn't feel that at all, right? I walked out and I was just like, I mean, if they had killed off all the Eternals at the end of the movie, it would probably have the same feeling. Be like, okay, so like it's a movie that exists and I guess it's in the MCU. And so people did some things, you know, and, and, you know, I, I basically walked out of the movie with this kind of feeling like, okay, so like there were some people with some powers and they did some things and they fought people and we're here now. And so now we're leaving, right? And that's it. And it was just kind of like, all right. <laughs> right, it's just the, the the characters, you don't really have a reason to feel bad for them. You don't really have a reason to, to root for them or to hope they succeed. And the MCU is largely based on that, right? Spider-Man, for example, is a kid who's trying to be a superhero. Your desire to root for Spider-Man is really more predicated on just your knowledge of Spider-Man than it is the actual plot film itself. But if you look at somebody like Iron Man, right, he was a weapons manufacturer that was trying to turn his life around. So you can root for him, right? Steve Rogers, Captain America, was a guy out of time who seemingly lost everything. So you were hoping he could make it in the modern era. It was things like that, right? Thor was looking to redeem himself. With the Eternals, it's just kind of like, I mean, there's no motivation to root for these guys. There's no, there's nothing to be like, man, I hope they really come out on top because if they don't, man, imagine the catastrophe. Your desire to see the eternal succeed is because you don't want to see the earth destroyed, but it's not really in relation to the Eternals themselves. There's nothing about Cersei's story or Fostos' story or Icarus' story or anybody's story where you want to see them succeed because of some personal struggle they've had to overcome that gives you an ability to relate to them, right? So that lacks in its entirety. They're just characters who are there and are doing things, and then it goes on for about two hours, and then the movie ends, and the day saved. Done and done. Now, having said that, the cool thing about this movie is the stage that it sets for the future of the MCU. So there's a few big things, spoilers here, right? There's a few big things to know. One, uh, over the course of the movie, it's basically revealed the Eternals on Earth are not the only Eternals that exist in the universe. We know that from the comics, right? We know that in the comics that you had Eternals on Earth, you had Uranus and you had Kronos. They got into a civil war. Uranus basically lost. He took off into space, eventually settled on Titan. Everybody wiped themselves out, except for a chick named Suisan. There was a second civil a war among the Eternals. This guy, Alars, left, went to Titan, started banging Suisan, and they had two sons, Thanos and Eros. So Eros shows up in a post credit scene in this movie, as does Pip the Troll, who's played by Patton Oswalt, which is amazing. <laughs> I need to get the kind of connections Patton Oswalt has, man, because I would love to just like have like a voiceover role in the MCU or something like that. I don't know what it is, man, but that guy, he's everywhere, man, and it's awesome to see. But 
Pip the Troll's there, Eros is there. Now this is significant because of the nature of the Eternals. So again, more of a spoiler here, you end up finding out the Eternals were basically built, that the, the Celestials initially built the Deviants. The Deviants were the ones who were basically supposed to in, make it possible for planets to serve the purpose of allowing Celestials to deposit their eggs in them, to clear out any predators and allow life to thrive so that that life could feed the Celestial Egg. And when the Celestial Egg was ready, it would emerge, right? It would basically destroy the planet and emerge out into the universe. Essentially the origin of how Celestial are made in Earth X is basically what it is. And so the problem here is that the Deviants not only wiped out the predators on the planet, they also started consuming the prey. And so the Celestials looked to correct this because they, there were just too many Deviants to destroy, I guess. They looked to correct this and they created the Eternals to destroy Deviants. And so the Eternals end up learning their true purpose. The, the thing about Eros here is that it seems to establish this idea that a lot of other Eternals out there actually learned the true role. They learned the truth of their creation at the hands of the Celestials and they defected. They broke off and they did their own thing. So I'm excited to see how that impacts the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think that's really, really cool. The, the, the next thing that you get is kind of the post, like the actual post credit scene because the Eero scene is more of a mid credit scene. The post post credit scene is basically Dane Whitman going to get the Ebony Blade. This was kind of a major issue when it came to his character is because there's this offhanded remark by Cersei or this kind of statement she makes in the aftermath of the realization that they don't seem to be able to stop the emergence that she in turn tells him, you should go make amends with your uncle. And it's like, okay, cool, whatever. Like there's not really a whole lot of information given there because literally Kit Harrington appears as a total of like 20 minutes over the course of the movie. So you don't really get the significance or the impact of that unless you're familiar with the character. But Dane Whitman is descended from Sir Percy of Scandia. He was the Black Knight for King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Now, at a time when King Arthur was basically being attacked and was ultimately defeated by his brother Mordred, that Merlin created the Ebony Blade as a means to defeat the forces of Mordred. The problem with this is the Ebony Blade has a curse, that a person who wields it will ultimately be corrupted by it the stronger they become, right? Their bloodlust will basically become uncontrollable and they'll be a slave to the sword. And so if you wield it long enough, it'll essentially destroy you. Now, we don't really know if that curse is an actual thing in the MCU. All we know in the post post credit scene is Dane Whitman goes to reach for the sword. Okay, so I'm standing outside Pet, uh, PetSmart right now and uh, we're taking Star in there so they can keep an eye on it while we go to Denver because we can't take her with us to go into the museum. But the important thing is this, uh, apparently Chloe Zhao did an interview with fandom and she revealed that the voice at the end of the movie that was talking to Dane Whitman was Blade. Mahershal Ali, that's crazy. I don't know how that's going to affect everything, but that's pretty boss. Uh, yeah, man. So I felt like I would just kind of add that in here, right? Just sort of tell you guys, that's apparently what's going on. Anyway, but overall, when it comes to this movie, it's it's okay, right? It's it's not a bad movie. Uh, apparently, Chloe Zhao had help from Denis Villeneuve making this movie. Denis Villeneuve, if you don't know, he's the one that made the newer Dune film. If she did get help, it shows because the movie's very very slow. It looks beautiful, and the hipsters and the old people will say that it's art, but it doesn't really feel like an MCU movie. And that's not a bad thing because the MCU formula was kind of growing stale. But while changing the MCU formula, I think is a great idea. Doing it in such a way to where the movie feels boring because it's like. 75% dialogue, that's a problem. <laughs> that's an issue, right? So again, you know, the movie, I don't think it was worth, I don't think it deserved 59% on Rotten Tomatoes, but I wouldn't give it anything near the 90s. I'd give it mid 70s at best and just kind of call it a day. So with that being said, guys, let me know what you think down in the comments section. Thank you all for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.